from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Enormous number of fans. You can just see the girls making custom t-shirts and having her sign it right behind this wall. She's also a fan of books herself. She waited dutifully in line for John Grisham to sign her son's book. But Jody is, a, is, as you probably all know, I'll just tell you a qu few quick things about her. She's, she's a Princeton grad and a one-time high school teacher. She's a former New Yorker and uh, New Hampshire mom. She's the champion of a, a sisterhood of readers that's welcomed more than a few brothers. She is also a sort of curator of private hurt that has turned into a public forum where everyone can share pain and loss, grief, joy, love. But she's a creator of indelible characters who thrive in her care, and sometimes she has to gently ease uh, into death. They die gently in her hands, and sometimes we do too, which is why her, next, her latest novel is called Handle With Care, and we're grateful to have her here today, Jody Pico. really glad that John Grisham opened for me today. <laughs> Thank you all for not leaving the tent when he did. That's great. Um, it is really a pleasure to be back here today. I actually, I, I don't do a lot of festivals, and I, I begged to come to this one this year because I'm so excited to be back here. And um, I don't have a lot of time to talk to you guys, so I'm going to give you a really brief history of how I got here, talk to you a little bit about Handle with Care and where that book came from, and then I hopefully we'll have some time to either tell you a funny story or get some questions from you. Um, a lot of people ask me when I knew I was going to be a writer, I can trace it back to fourth grade when I had a teacher who I really hope is dead right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know... <laughs> I was, in, I was in school, we came back to school after summer vacation, and she, she told us that we had to write what we did over summer vacation, which, as a former teacher, I will tell you, is the world's worst assignment. So I wrote about the piano that I had practiced on all summer, and I wrote it from the point of view of the piano. And uh, I got it back the next day, and I got an F. And uh, she said, you know, I didn't ask for a creative writing assignment. Now, to be honest, she did not ask for one either. And my mom, my mom marched down to the principal, got me transferred out of that class. And after that, I had a series of terrific teachers who knew I liked to write and really encouraged me to do so. So much so that I wound up applying to colleges that in the 1980s had an undergraduate creative writing program. And I was lucky enough to go to Princeton to work with living, breathing writers, where, like every other beginning writer, I was told, write what you know. Unfortunately, it didn't take me very long to realize I knew absolutely nothing. <laughs> you know, I had grown up in the suburbs of New York. My parents are still happily married. I have a little brother, and I like him. You know, <laughs> I thought, <laughs> if I'm going to be a writer, aren't I supposed to have a little anguish or something going on? And, and I remember calling my mom from college and asking her if maybe there was just a little incest I didn't know about in our family. <laughs> but no. Um, <laughs> Instead, I realized that if I was going to write, what I was going to have to do instead was to write what I was willing to learn instead of what I knew. And that sort of geared me up for a whole series of novels where I, I do tons of research, even though I write fiction, which is supposed to be made up, right? You know, if you, you actually look up the word fiction in Webster's Dictionary, it's defined as something invented by the imagination or feigned. We know that it covers genres like fantasy with worlds that don't exist and genres like romance with men that don't exist. And yet... <laughs> except for my husband, who's right there. <laughs> and yet, you know, I've been doing this now for about 20 years and I've never just sat down and made it all up. And in fact, there are some novels that I spend more time researching than I do physically writing, which is pretty remarkable. What I'm going to do now is briefly tell you about um, some of the research that went into Handle with Care. And I'm really excited to be here talking about Handle with Care, because if there was ever a healthcare reform book, this is it. <laughs> 
Now, um, Handle with Care, the basic plot is that it's the story of the O'Keefe family. And that means mom, Charlotte, dad, Sean, big sister, Amelia, and little Willow O'Keefe. Willow is seven years old, and she suffers from a condition called osteogenesis imperfecta. She has type 3, which is the most severe kind you can have without dying at birth. And that means that over the course of her life, she will have hundreds of thousands to bone breaks, of bone breaks. She will be no more than about 3 feet tall. She'll have severe respiratory complications. She will need rotting surgery in her thighs and in her back. Um, a lot of hearing issues, dental issues. In other words, a very compromised physical existence. But kids who have osteogenesis imperfecta, for the most part, are 100% mentally all there, if not even smarter than their peers, because when everyone else is running around on the playground, they're sitting down with their cast on their leg reading a book instead. Like many other parents of children with disabilities, the O'Keeffe's find that they are extremely financially strapped because insurance doesn't even begin to cover what they need for their daughter. And Charlotte thinks she has found the answer in a wrongful birth lawsuit. If she sues her obstetrician for not telling her in advance that her child was gonna be born with this condition, she might wind up with a huge monetary payout in the millions. There are only two catches. She's gonna to have to stand up in court and say, well, if I had known about this in advance, I would have terminated the pregnancy. Words that her own daughter is gonna hear her say. And the obstetrician that she's suing, well, that happens to be her best friend. So that's the premise of Handle with Care. And I get asked a lot, well, where did you come up with this one? Because it's not really on the radar. Well, it actually began for me on book tour when I was reading the New York Times Magazine. And there was an article in there about a woman who had sued for wrongful birth after she had a severely disabled child. And you know, I read about it. A wrongful birth lawsuit basically says that um, you're suing your obstetrician for not giving you information that should have been given as part of normal medical care. And uh, you know, the idea is that a lot of parents do this because it does give them a big payout. So my immediate visceral reaction was, that is just disgusting. I can't believe a mother would do that. And then I wondered, wow, how did I make that judgment so fast? And I decided I really wanted to learn a little more about it. So I met and talked to this mother as well as other people who had sued for wrongful birth. And what I learned was that her friends and family completely vilified her for doing this in the first place. And like every other family that I did meet that had a wrongful birth lawsuit, none of them ever really wanted to terminate that pregnancy. They love these kids to death, but they can't figure out a way to give their kids the best life possible. And this seems like a really easy little white lie all you got to do is stand up in court and say, well, I would have terminated the pregnancy. Now, wrongful birth has a pretty interesting history in this country. The first wrongful birth lawsuit began in 1966. It was filed in New Jersey, and the court said the doctors were to blame, but they didn't think that the court should get into the business of deciding which embryos survived and which didn't. And so um, they actually just overturned the case and wouldn't rule on it. In 1973, something very different happened. Roe versus Wade passed. And then the next wrongful birth lawsuit popped up in 1978 in New York. And this time the court found in favor of the family that was seeking financial damages because they said the obstetrician had not given them all the information possible. Right now, over 20 states in America allow wrongful birth suits, as well as many European countries, including France and Britain. They certainly contribute to the sense that Americans are litigious. And when you look at it from a parent's point of view, it's a medical malpractice suit. Did you get the appropriate standard of care during pregnancy? Were all the tests done, and were they read correctly? From the obstetrician's point of view, it's a morality question. Who gets to decide what type of life is worth living? Is it the doctor? Is it the patient? Is it the baby itself? In other words, it moves past that controversy of abortion into which child should be terminated if that is an issue. I met with a lot of OBGYNs to hear their point of view as well. And the story that I like to tell the most came from an OB who lives in my hometown who was sued because she had a client, a, a patient, who had a baby that um, had severe, severe 
defects, a lot of disabilities. And during all of the ultrasound, she kept telling the parents, there's something wrong, there's something wrong, I don't know what it is, but there are severe abnormalities in this fetus. The parents decided to have the baby, and then they sued her for wrongful birth. It turned out that the child had a genetic disorder called trisomy 9Q. It had never been diagnosed before until this child was born. In 2004, in spite of the fact that the diagnosis did not exist, the jury found in favor of the parents and awarded them $2.3 million. In 2006, the Supreme Court of New Hampshire reversed that decision. And most of the wrongful birth lawsuits that you hear about involve children who have severe physical and mental disabilities. But I kind of wondered what would happen if I created a situation where it was a very compromised physically compromised child, but mentally this child was extremely bright. And that's what led me to osteogenesis imperfecta. Now, osteogenesis imperfecta affects one in t between 1 in 10,000 and 25,000 adults, um, I mean Americans. And the reason the range is so big is because it goes undiagnosed a lot. There are people who just break their bones a lot who never know they have OI. But the most severe form is really pretty visible because, like I said before, these kids only wind up being about three feet tall, often have twisted limbs, have severe complications, many are wheelchair bound. Um, it's been around for a long time. The first diagnosis was in 1895, but there's an Egyptian mummy that was found from 1000 BC, who they have now proven to have had, osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, there's a guy named Ivan the Boneless, who was from 9th century Denmark. He was a prince who used to get carried into battle on his shield. Um, because he couldn't walk, and he had osteogenesis imperfecta. And most recently, the painter Toulouse-Lautrec was posthumously diagnosed with osteogenesis imperfecta. To learn a little about this, this condition, I wound up spending a lot of time with families of children that have OI. And I did everything from spotting them in the playground, because not only do you have to worry about whether the kid falls, you've got to make sure no one bumps into him or runs into him, um, to changing diapers, to at one point riding with a mom in a car, the son, Matthew, is in the back seat, and uh, we were taking him home from school. They can't ride the bus because the bumps in the road give them microfractures. And so she said to me as we got to the driveway, can you just take Matthew out of his car seat? And I went, oh, yeah. I mean, I've done this 8,000 times in my life. And I went to go reach in, and I realized, oh, my gosh, what if I'm the one who snaps his arm this time? And this, of course, is something that these parents deal with really on a daily basis. One mother told me how she had used to dream about pinning a note to her daughter's um, blanket and leaving her in a basket when she was an infant after she had something like her 40th break before she was one year old and saying on this note, maybe you can do a better job. Another mom told me about her daughter who had the morphine jump. She was allergic to morphine and she had broken her femur and was waiting for surgery in a hospital. And the mom literally had to lie on top of her daughter so that when she went like this from the morphine, she wouldn't jar the bone and hurt herself even worse. They told me how you go about getting a kid who is wearing a cast that goes from chest all the way down to their knees to pee, a little tidbit the doctors do not tell you, which involve putting trash bag liners on the open inside that's left right around the genital area so that you don't splash the cast, which they're going to be wearing for four or five months. They told me how you can learn how to make a splint from a magazine that you find in the back of your car. And then I met with the kids themselves, like Rachel, who told me that every time she breaks a bone, it feels like lightning under her skin, and that the whites of her eyes flash blue, which I heard from many parents, which is really creepy and freaky. Um, from Little Hope, who, because she has OI type 3, is only about that big, maybe about two feet tall, um, but is six and a half years old. And at the restaurant, was writing the names of her family and writing a story on the back of her placemat. And the waitress just could not get over the fact that this little toddler was so smart. And she hated being called a toddler. Um, but probably the most interesting woman I met was a woman named Kara Sheridan. Kara is an adult who is um, a graduate student right now getting her PhD in body image for disabled young women. She uh, just got married. And she was a Paralympian in 2004, a swimmer for the American team in Greece. And Kara also has OI. And Kara was the one who told me that rotting surgeries for the spine, which are not often covered by insurance, will cost up to $150,000 a pop. 
how an insurance company will only fit a child in a wheelchair once every five years. Now, I don't know about you, but my child between age five and 10, he changed considerably and would not fit in the same size wheelchair. Um, she told me how she used to be very careful when she was living in Florida to not make more than $700 a month because then she wouldn't be covered by Medicaid. Why would I write a book like Handle with Care? Because most of you, thankfully, are probably never going to come into contact personally with someone who has OI or have a family member that's got it. Well, it certainly raises awareness about the condition, which is a great byproduct of a novel. But it also really asks us, I think, to ask some very important questions in this country. First of all, what kind of message does a wrongful birth lawsuit send about how society values a person with a disability? But then again, who has the right to judge a parent who sees on a daily basis the suffering of a child with a disability? And finally, and maybe most importantly, especially right now, to what extent does healthcare coverage or the lack thereof lead desperate families to file lawsuits like this? And how would changes in healthcare coverage make it easier for a parent to give a child with a disability every advantage possible? I know that I love coming to this festival because you've got the Capitol on one side, you've got the Washington Monument on the other, and you can stand up here and say, I really hope that's something I get to see very soon in my lifetime. So <laughs> Maybe, maybe if we all keep clapping, the Obamas will show up. What do you think? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I've got about 10 minutes left, and I want to open the floor up to your questions. So if you've got a question, I believe, do we have mics? There's no way you're going to get to a mic. All right, let's see. I'll just try to call. Oh, there are mics. Look at this. All right, great. You get to go first. Hi, I work in the medical field, and I just wondered, did you come across any families when given the choice to not continue care on their kids, decline that choice and continue the care on the kids? <coughs> you mean of... Um, of the OI? Of OI. Uh -huh. I did not run into any parents who, um, you know, who wanted to have, uh, or who were offered the chance to have kids taken away from them. What I did run into, and this comes up in the book, and it comes up very often with parents who have children with OI, is many parents are accused of child abuse because they go into a hospital, and if you are working with a physician who doesn't know your child, there they are with 40 breaks in their arm that are all healing, and of course the immediate, the immediate reaction in the healthcare community is the parent must have done this. Sure. Yes. Just a question, what inspired you to do all the research on eugenics? What inspired me to do all the research on eugenics? Great question. She's talking about a book called Second Glance, which happens to be my personal favorite. And is, um, it's a rollicking ghost story, but it's also very much about the eugenics project in Vermont and other places in this country in the 1930s. The reason I got inspired to do that was I, I actually was looking up ghost stories, and I happened to stumble across the story, the real-life story of what was going on in Vermont in the 1930s when a bunch of very, very intelligent people, professors and, um, and uh, uh, politicians in Vermont were championing the idea of keeping Vermont a tourist community by getting rid of people who they thought were a social and economic drain on it. And so they went around and they made up these genealogy charts of degenerate families. You actually didn't have to be related to be a degenerate family. But they went into uh, prisons and poorhouses and mental institutions where, you know, go figure, you never found those white Protestant Yankees. But you found a lot of Catholic French Canadians and a lot of Abenaki Indians. And in Vermont, they wound up um, sterilizing a lot of those people. And I was so fascinated by this because I didn't know that America was in the business of eugenics. I didn't know that Hitler thanked the states in America that did his homework for him. And I thought, you know, if I'm writing a book about things that come back to haunt us, this was just what I needed to write about. Yes. I was just wondering, your character, Jordan McAfee, yeah. he said a few times that he only wants to hear the truth from his clients. Uh -huh. Is that... Um, how the American legal system actually works? No, actually, what a great question. Why are you asking me? Ask John Grisham. But um, <laughs> <laughs> the question was about whether or not Jordan McAfee, who's one of my favorite lawyers, he's come back in a few books, um, whether or not he, he says, I want to hear the truth from my clients, um, whether that's true. Is that what lawyers want? Actually, they don't. 
They really don't because they get in trouble. If, if you are a defense attorney and your client tells you the truth, you then can't have him up on the stand because he might impeach his own testimony. So actually, you really don't ever want to know what your client did if you're a defense attorney, which I think is a fascinating thing. And interestingly, you know, it really makes law about who can spin the best story. And to be honest, if you know, you're in a, a murder trial and your defense is that the defendant happened to be the Queen of England at the moment the murder was committed, if you can get the jury to believe that, well, hey, good, that's all you need to do. It's really about storytelling, which is kind of interesting because I think we like to believe it's always about the truth. Yeah. I loved My Sister's Keeper, the book and the movie. How'd you feel about the change in plot? <laughs> <laughs> I should probably ask whether Nick Cassavetes or anyone related to him is here first, but um, here's the deal. Uh, what most people don't realize about the transition of books to film is that we authors have the lowest spot on the totem pole. Often they don't ask us anything. We have no idea what they're casting, what they're doing. We don't write the script. Um, I had a couple of, of unfortunate experiences during that process that involved being blatantly lied to, to my face. Um, I will tell you that I think it was a good film. I think the acting was stellar, and I think they made the world's biggest mistake by changing the ending. <laughs> yeah. I heard that you had published two short stories for Seventeen Magazine. Mm -hmm. I want to know what were those two stories and what were they about? Oh, God. Okay, so this is my very first publishing experience. I was in college, and I had written you know, this, this paper, basically, for a creative writing class. And my teacher was the incredible Mary Morris, an amazing author. And she finally said to me, will you just go send this somewhere? And I thought, like, where? I mean, you're my teacher. I'm writing it for a class. And she said, no, no, send it to Seventeen Magazine. So I mean, I was poor. I was a student. I couldn't even afford Seventeen, so I just looked up the name of the editor and then put it back on the shelf, you know? And I wrote this, I wrote this cover letter, and I sent the story off to her. And it was called Keeping Count. I think that was the first one. And um, about three months later, I had this phone call on my answering machine at college from this editor saying they wanted to pay me for my short story. And I was like, first I called all my friends because I thought they were teasing me, you know. But then I called her back and I thought, you want to pay me? I would have paid you. I mean, this is incredible. <laughs> and she wound up buying that short story and then another one after that. They came out in February and August of 1987. And they were both about my high school boyfriend who totally broke my heart. So it's good revenge. <laughs> and the funny thing is that, you know, I guess people knew that they were about him. Some people who knew us both knew they were about him. And people like he didn't even know who had known a friend of a friend like came up and threw things at him after they came out. It was great. <laughs> yeah. I just finished reading Plain Truth. Uh -huh. And I really loved Ellie Hathaway and that character. So I was wondering where she came from and whether we might ever see her again in the oh, that's future. That's a good question. You know, I haven't thought about bringing Ellie back. Usually when I bring a character back, it's because I feel like I haven't finished telling their story. And I do think her story has pretty much been told. You sort of know where she and Coop are going after the end of Plain Truth and what's going to happen in their lives. And, and I'm happy with where we left her. Um, what she came from, really, was the, the rubbing up of two justice systems, the idea of the American justice system where if you confess, you know, basically you're going to jail. And the Amish justice system where if you confess, fabulous, you're forgiven and everyone welcomes you back into the fold. So if you have a client as an American lawyer who happens to be Amish and she confesses, it's going to be a real hot mess for you. And that was, you know, why I wanted to make her sort of this tough as nails attorney who really didn't like to get involved personally with clients because Katie has to teach her as much about herself as she has to teach Katie about what justice is in this country. Sure. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, um, what would be your best piece of advice that you would personally give to any aspiring writers, especially younger ones? Great question. I get asked that all the time, as you can imagine. The first thing I would say is if you want to be a writer, you should be reading. I know that even now, I, when I read, yeah, right? I mean, we are at the book festival, yeah. Um, you know, and, and here's the other thing, especially if you're a teacher of young kids, don't tell them what to read. Let them read what they want to read, you know? You know, I, I used to teach eighth grade English, and I remember, yeah, you know, we taught all these great short story masters, and, you know, we did, we did all of that stuff, but then the kids would also be reading Stephen King, and that's totally cool. 
And you know, I, I hate that distinction in this country between literary fiction and commercial fiction because I think it's arbitrary and stupid. And frankly, you know, the poetry and prose tent and the fiction and fantasy could all merge. It would be fine. You know, and, and I think people like to read different things too. Um, so I think reading is a big part of it because reading will inspire you and will also help you figure out where your books and your stories fit in to the, the grand fabric of writing in America. Uh, the other thing I would suggest is to write often and frequently, daily if you can, just so that it becomes something that you can do on demand. Um, I don't believe in waiting for a muse. Um, I have three kids. I don't have time to believe in waiting for a muse. And so when I sit down and I'm writing, I'm writing. And there are some days I'm really good at it. And there are other days I'm like, you know, oh, gosh, I need to check my email again. I mean, you know, there are some days that you work well and others you don't. But on the other hand, it is a job, even if it's one that you love. And you have to get used to writing on demand. I also highly recommend taking a fiction workshop course at some point in your life. You don't have to go to Princeton. You can take them at a Borders or a Barnes & Noble or a community college or even at your high school probably. And what that does is teach you how to give and get criticism. Because ultimately, when you're a writer, you have to become your own best critic. Not your editor. You're going to make more cuts probably than she ever will. And so that's the goal that you're, you're getting toward. And here's probably the most important thing. When you start writing a story, and you suddenly decide that it is truly the biggest piece of garbage ever created in the history of the English language, force yourself to finish it. Because too many beginning writers don't do that and will never know if they can. I know it's scary, but if you get through to the end of it, you can then decide whether you want to scrap it or whether you want to fix it. And that's what you really need to do. Thank you for You're welcome. <laughs> Hi. First of all, you're wonderful. Um, Thanks. <laughs> I have a, a question about the names and the personalities of your characters. Yep. Do you know these people, or are they people you've interviewed? How do you come up with such? I totally know all of them. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm with them for nine months That's while I'm true. writing, but but they are made up. And I get asked that a lot. I get asked whether I create my characters based on people I know, and I don't because the characters land in my brain. They land almost fully formed. And for me, they come with a voice first. I can usually hear them talking before I really know who they are. Um, and for me, that's, that's sort of the way that the story develops through their mouths and through their voices. Um, it would be weird for me to, to take a character that, that is already talking to me and already thinking in my brain and give them the personality of my mother, for example, because they'd wind up with two personalities, plus my mother is strange. You know, so, you know, it's, no, she's not, she's great. But you know, so I, I would never really do that. On the other hand, what I do all the time is take, um, take stories or arguments or conversations that I've either had with friends or overheard, and I give those to my characters constantly. So that um, when you're reading them, you know, sometimes my friends will read them and say, didn't I tell you that? You know, I go, yeah, well, you did. Um, there's actually, there's a great scene in The Pact, which is an argument between a husband and wife, and it happens to be a fight that my husband and I had, but every time you read it, I win. <laughs> so, no. Yeah. I think we probably have time for one more question, if there is one. You got one. What's next? I was going to tell you if we didn't have a question. That's great. What is next? Well, um, the next book I have, Handle With Care, just came out, hot off the presses in paperback, which is very exciting, good for Christmas stockings or anything you need. Um, but the next new book that will come out is in March, the first Tuesday of March. It is called House Rules. And it is the story of Jacob Hunt, who is an 18-year-old boy with Asperger's syndrome. Jacob is a really bright kid um, who happens, like many kids with Asperger's, to have a very, very special fixation on one topic. His is forensics and crime scene analysis. And that's all fine and good until he winds up accused of a murder himself. And the book is really about how our justice system usually works pretty well if you communicate a certain way. But I want you to think for a second about anyone you've ever met who's autistic and how you've got... Um, not looking someone in the eye, or running away if touched, or not answering questions, or answering them in a flat affect. If a cop heard that, they're immediately going to think guilt. And that really creates a very interesting little conundrum. And the book after that, which is what I'm currently writing, I'm very excited about because it is what I believe the last civil right to address in America is. It is about embryo donation and gay rights. So look out for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.